3966 to 4005 in the amount of $214,683.79, ACH number 19200112122 through 20214008 in the amount of $169,000. $868.38 for a total of $384,552.17. Financial report from July 2020, consideration of 2020-2021, current bills, checks number 4006 to 4034 in the amount of $87,043.60 and ACH number 2021 to 2021-00034 in the amount of $443,700.77 and one wire transfer in the amount of $6,553.57 for a total of $537,297.94. Total checks, ACH and wire transfers for this reporting period is $921,850.11. Okay, uh, any questions or comments on anything on the consent agenda? Uh, then we go ahead and do a roll call vote. Walter? Yes. Bolding? Yes. D? Yes. Mead? Yes. Neutral? Yes. Hyatt? Yes. Mary? Yes. Okay, we'll go on to a public comment. I don't see the book. No one signed in. Okay. Then we'll go on to uh, the COVID update. Okay. Listed there under letter A, you'll um, see the reopening plan is listed. But as long as COVID update is our heading, I would like to address the communication that went out uh, just today about canceling August 2nd in person graduation ceremony. Um, certainly it wasn't our intent not to have the board weigh in again um, because when we shared the preliminary data it really didn't ch uh, change much since last month so um, and for those of you in the audience there we reached out to students the high school staff did and we had only 80 respondents and 60 of them indicated that they would attend the August 2nd graduation. So based on that and other factors, a small committee decided not to pursue it, um, but we failed to address it here this evening to see if the board wanted to weigh in on that um, notion. So if you do have thoughts to the contrary, I mean, certainly, we should hear those. Um, wouldn't be the last time we've changed the communication, but. No, but I think it would have been nice to have the board weigh in on that, especially when we are talking about reopening the school. Correct. When you are pushing for in-person in education in the classrooms, how is that okay when we don't have an in-person graduation? Mm -hmm. Good how point. Does, how does that? The optics don't look great. Mm -hmm. May I add on that? Mm -hmm. um, the hope from for having that date was to um, give those give those families some of the traditional pieces of a graduation ceremony that they had been used to, and in communication with some of the students, that's what they really desired that to be, and in, in the um, state that we're in, we couldn't offer some of those traditional pieces in the way that the, the students would, had hoped. I guess that was the discussion and the sentiment around that decision. And as we move on, you'll see that even our recommendation tonight looks um, vastly different from any traditional learning that we might be accustomed to. So with that, um, this is this has been emailed now to the board and for the public it's up on the screen. Admin has a copy. We made changes as late as today. Um, every time you read the news you'll see that districts are 
modifying, et cetera, so we wanted to have, as current as we could, a recommendation for you this evening. So we simply start as a reminder with our new mission and vision, which um, we're becoming accustomed to driving our decisions as it should. So the district ensures high levels of learning for each and every student through high quality instruction. Every student and staff member experiences a sense of belonging and authentic supportive relationships. In partnership with our community, we commit to fostering student well-being and learning success. Just like to point out that word well-being is in there long before the pandemic, but perhaps it's never been more critical than now. So our primary goal, again, you'll see the word well-being, is to foster the well-being of students, families, and staff by keeping the physical, emotional, and educational health of all at the forefront of every decision we make. We were really pleased with our family responses. We had 1,231 responses. And we asked families to respond more than once if they had more than one child because we um, desegregated by elementary, middle, and high school levels. So we had a 61% response rate. And you'll see with the first pie chart there, at that time, and this was the end of June, at that time, uh, the majority felt comfortable physically sending their child to school either full or part-time. Darlene Jensen, though, made a very good point when we met with local health officials. That survey went out um, prior to our first Langley County death, for example. We know that as information changes, families' minds will change. And so that's why, should the board choose to endorse this plan, the next step of asking for family input would be the most critical um, and they would not be held, obviously, to this survey. The next pie chart has to do with our recently purchased technology because for the first time, the Unified School District of Antigo will be able to offer remote instruction. I'm changing that word off the, just on the spur of the moment here. CESA nine superintendents agreed to use the word remote as opposed to virtual. Virtual um, can carry the connotation that it's somebody else's curriculum, it's somebody else doing the instruction. Um, RVA, for example, is a virtual academy. We would be offering remote instruction. It would be our instructors, our curriculum, but the students would be safely at home. We had an open-ended question on families' greatest concerns. They are, these are not listed in order of, um, um, as they appeared, they're just the top three. So in general, families were concerned about the education their children are going to receive this fall, obviously worried about health and safety, and then many were uh, worried about remote instruction and learning if that were the only option available. We also surveyed staff. And while you saw the survey questions, this is the first time you're seeing the staff survey results. So we emailed all staff, so everyone from the uh, custodial department to administrators, certified and support staff, so 261 and had a 75% response rate. And the first pie chart there, you'll see that over 87% feel okay, or they might even feel good about things, but of course there are worries. And then those little slivers of color um, will be the less frequent indicators, but nonetheless we have to address every one of them. I met with a staff member today um, whose physician recommends that she works only remotely. So obviously we're going to accommodate that. 
that's a physician recommendation. So the next page then, family survey results indicate about 70% would like to have their students physically at school. I just read today that nationally that's as low as 19%. So it is possible that ours wouldn't be this high the next time we ask. So knowing that, when we ask staff, how do we accommodate, and the ellipsis means the question was cut off there to fit on the slide, but how do we accommodate cohorts of students? In other words, if I'm a third grade teacher and my kids have to stay together all day, they may be eating lunch with me in my classroom. So at prep as I know it may change, there may not be the traveling to art class as they used to. Maybe the art teacher will come in, et cetera. But the other piece of this is we're also rolling out for the first time a virtual, I'm sorry, got myself a remote learning option. That is going to take a lot. And unfortunately, um, it's brand new. You know, the board approved that we could buy the devices and now under Rachel and her team's leadership, we're getting there, but staff is facing a very significant learning curve. That being said, well over half of them, in fact almost 70% of staff, are saying that um, it would be good to have a modified school week so that that preparation and that learning can be done uh, outside of having face-to-face -face contact with kids because they will be responsible for both. Staff will be responsible for both face-to-face -face learning and remote, although we hope to have it um, balanced with percentages. Let's say hypothetically 20% of our students are learning remotely, well then we could expect at least 20% <coughs> of our staff to be facilitating that primarily with input from their uh, departments and classroom teachers. So when the board um, selects an option tonight, or whether you choose to endorse this, whether you choose to endorse our recommendation, we would ask you to consider that um, slightly limited work week. A four-day um, week, I shouldn't have said work, school week because that fifth day would still be virtual for students and um, we would have opportunities for staff then to make games of that remote learning and instruction. So a four day, a school week, or perhaps five shortened days. Um, districts initially said, and it came out in the DPI guidance as you may recall, they suggested a four day school week for deep cleaning. After consulting with Jake, he's convinced we don't need that. And I know Dr. McKenna, you weighed in on that at one of our meetings too. We believe we can clean sufficiently and well in the evenings. We don't feel we need a whole day for a deep clean. Um, what we do feel we need that day for is um, for staff to adapt to this new model. Julie, so are you anticipating like they would make content for each other? So they take that last Friday, let's say, and they'd make seven hours worth of video or something that the kids would watch the next week? Or would they be home watching or would the kids have that? So the um, remote learning students would have something obviously on that fifth day, JD. The students who are physically present may just have practice, it would not equate to seven hours. Even remote learning isn't um, in that ballpark. If you recall, when we closed in the spring, it was vastly different because of the sustainability for families to have that screen time. Uh, I understood JD's question to mean uh, if teachers gotta be teaching remotely and in the classroom, mm -hmm. are they using that fifth day yes. to prepare for the next five days of remote yeah. because they can't be doing it while they're in the classroom. If that is accurate. Mm -hmm. Right, otherwise yes. are they just recording their classroom <clears throat> and putting that online? We want to do that too, but that's not what that fifth day would be. If I'm teaching, for example, I would like to think a partner um, 
colleague can be in there if it's a lesson we determine that is appropriate for remote learning yes that tape should be going and we can upload it but that is not only what the fifth day would be for it would be that planning and staying ahead of the curve and becoming familiar with canvas which is what we'll ask you to approve tonight so say that one more time so if the student if the teachers in the classroom teaching their class you might record that and let the kids watch it at home sometime not right. necessarily live correct so would the fifth day be like an in-service day like the teachers would be working and yes all okay. teachers right would report unless they are excused to work remotely and collaborate and oh, so they um, would, if they're the go in the building people they would go in the mm -hmm. building okay mm -hmm. okay yep because that would allow for that collaboration and the um, again if if it weren't such a significant learning curve if we were familiar as a district with remote learning I don't believe we'd make that recommendation except that um, it helps us with that regard for students what will help with social distancing which is as you know one of the um, primary precautions we have to take what will help with that is having families select remote learning or in person and I'll get to that and once we have those numbers we'll know better how how we will meet both um, options okay so the proposal looks something like this we would ask each parent guardian or care caretaker to choose one for each child because as you understand if I have a sophomore and a third grader I might choose a different option for each Initially, we were thinking we'd have families on the same schedule, but it would have been our schedule. It would have been um, forcing families to fit in like an A, B schedule or an, a week on, week off. But then in having a conversation with um, Jake after we started down that road, we thought, he thought, and made the recommendation, why don't we ask families because they will naturally then choose the option that works best for them. And I, it's like the, you know, C's part that I was so thrilled. Now we have to keep in mind, the numbers would have to work. I don't expect it to happen, but what if we had 95% say we want to come back in person? That would be tough to socially distance but then we would cross that bridge when we get there. I believe, based on you know speaking with families and other input, that they will self-select and will be able to manage the numbers in each. The communication to families after tonight has to be very clear, however. If they select attend to school physically, we want to make sure they understand that it will not look like it did in years past. We'll have a cohort model. Students aren't going to, you know, be all over. And we are going to keep those cohorts of kids together as much as we can. High school is a different beast, you understand. But we think it's manageable at both elementary and middle. We may have to have limited elective options. That's to be determined. I already spoke to you about a limited or an altered schedule. And um, if someone has to travel, most likely have it be a staff member as opposed to kids. Conversely, with the remote option, we would make sure that our families understand it's available to every student, but it may be more appropriate for older students. Some districts, DC Everest is the most recent I read, are planning um, if they have to start remotely, it will be for high school and then they are asking their younger uh, students' families to select. And again, that's only possible because the board approved the technology purchase, so we thank you again. Then in meeting with Dr. McKenna oh, and Darlene sorry, and... So if yep. a high school student elects remote, mm -hmm. how is that going to work for credits? 
like, will that be, like, they'll get their normal A, B, C, D grade, they'll take the tests. I mean, presumably it'd be a lot yes. easier to take a test at home, unless you're switching everything to, like, an essay. I'm just wondering about for, like, college rankings and stuff like that. Yes, it would be um, the remote option of what's happening in the classroom. We couldn't do that, JD, in the spring. And that was tough for us as educators. But we couldn't um, forge ahead because we didn't have access for every student. It's different now. So we would also want families to understand that their selection does not have to be permanent. We anticipate that in-person to remote learning has to be fluid, daily fluid. And why? Well, what if somebody in my home was exposed to a positive and I'm quarantined? We don't want learning to stop for that student so he or she can pick up remotely the very next day. Conversely, we want to be ready for families who say, okay, we tried this remote, we're ready to come back. That's a little bit different because we have to make sure we have the staffing and the spacing available. So we thought we would open that up quarterly. And then of course, um, the health department and others can make recommendations for us or impose something like a closure. Um, and then the good news this time is we'd all be remote and we wouldn't come to a screeching halt. Do you think um, if 75% of the kids say they want to come back, can we handle that in the classroom? We believe we can. We would make use like this space, for example. What a beautiful space. Um, so we can limit classroom congestion by using spaces like this. So I saw the email today, but so masks for kids at any grade level is what's our thinking on that i think that's coming up in okay. one or two jd um and then we'll i'm interested in the board's input on that so um, I, have a, I have a question mm -hmm. if we have somebody who wants to commit to remote learning and we have the technology but what if they don't have the uh, internet available great question the board approved purchase of Kajit hotspots. Now, Tim and others who have more technological prowess than I tell me that those will only work if the infrastructure, is that the right word? Is available. <laughs> so if I have really poor internet access, if there's not a. No cell phone? Yes. It might not help me. So, but what we're. Um, anticipating Jessica as we can check those out like you would a, a device and families can check them out and hopefully that would be enough to um, meet their needs we don't know how many I know there's broadband discussions ongoing I just read again today that there's a task force statewide but until that's in place we're limited to what we can do and that is providing these hot spots. Is elementary or like Spring Valley and Pleasant View still broadcasting Wi-Fi or is that done? We're not advertising that because, um, right, we're not in session. But will that be a possibility or do we not know yet? What are you going to do? We We'd have to check with the owners. There, so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay. I think there's opportunities just to, there's opportunities for us to be creative as well. Um, as I was talking with DPI regarding special education, because that's another piece that we have to work through. They had some really good ideas about utilizing our community spaces as well. So let's say a parent doesn't want their child in school, but they don't have access to internet. Mm -hmm. What are our community spaces that might be available that we can meet at or utilize as well? So. In fact, Heidi Angel Zimmerman from the Boys and Girls Club emailed me just before I left to come here. I didn't have a chance to read it, but she's been attending our meetings wanting to partner as well. So I'm, I'm certain they would jump in if they could help. So precautionary measures, some go without saying, and we take our lead again from the um, health experts in the community. but. We would have really 
strong protocols and staff would be self-screening and self-reporting. Parents, we would ask to pay really close attention and err on the side of caution if there are any symptoms whatsoever and keep that child home. And then all 4K through grade three, we decided we would take the temperature because they may not be good at self-reporting. And then um, the mark is 100.5 degrees and then we're working on isolation rooms so that that child isn't in contact with the general population or a class of students um, should he or her should he or she be running a fever. Other precautionary measures, no parents or other visitors allowed in the schools for the opening or reopening. We'll want to do the best job we can tracking who's been where and so we felt if we communicated that really clearly that our public would be accustomed to that and just not um, attempt. There'd have to be a lot of call and email communication. Here it is, JD. Staff would be required to wear face coverings when working with students. If I happen to be alone in my classroom and I am prepping for the next day, I would not be required. But whenever you're in contact with others, and then there is a school of thought, we've discussed it as superintendents as well, about students wearing face coverings. And in general, the thought is um, most will, if I'm the teacher and it's my expectation, and I'd appreciate very much since I'm wearing one, if you'd put one on as well, we think most kids will. Youngers, elementary, may have trouble keeping it on. There will be some who can't wear it for, um, you know, perhaps an underlying reason. And then there could be some who, you know, just if it, if we said it's a mandate, we may have a sophomore, for example, say, I'm, I'm not wearing it. And then we have to be ready for that. What does that look like? So our recommendation would be that we strongly encourage and individual teachers I feel would have the best chance if it comes from me to a parent guardian or caregiver you know then it's imposed but if I'm with a teacher that I respect and admire and I'm you know happy to be with him or her and the suggestion is okay now we're going to come together, hopefully still six feet apart, but it would be best if we had our masks on. We think students in general will do that. But what are your thoughts? I know you received an email um, hoping that there could be a student mandate. Uh, as someone who works with the public, I can tell you they will not be wearing their masks. Do you wear one, all, do you wear one a lot? Do you I wear one. one. I'm the okay, I can't only them, one, I think, that wears it of the workers, but I would say that probably 75% of people, maybe higher, do not wear masks. I know in, in our office, the way it's structured right now, when they call people back, you're required to have your temp taken before you come in. Mm -hmm. You have to wear a mask when you're in the common areas, but if you're seated at your desk in social distancing or whatever, there you don't have to. Yeah, okay, so how long do the droplets stay in there? The question was, how long do droplets stay in the air? There's still that no. Is, that's, and now they're talking about the aerosolization, that. not just the droplets. And I have a problem with this because uh, everywhere you are looking at uh, departmental stores and uh, community areas where people are now being required to wear masks for tent. Um, if you are offering the option of saying that it is highly encouraged but not required, mm -hmm. If I am sending my child to school or I am coming to teach, I expect that the school district also provides for my protection. We have studies out there, there are a lot of data which suggest that when everybody is masked, your chances of transmission goes down. Mm -hmm. So how are we requiring our staff members to wear it, but at the same time, the students who are coming in 
you are not requiring them to. You have an option where if they are uncomfortable coming for in-person learning, then you are offering them the option of remote learning, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So if you are coming there, I mm -hmm. think we have some societal obligation to one another and the community at large to ensure that we don't get the other people sick. There might be kids in there who might go home to their grandmas and grandpas and mm -hmm. they might have parents who are uh, sick or immunosuppressed or something that puts them at a higher risk. Right. So I, I don't think I'd agree with the, uh, giving them the option of not wearing it. You know, we can reach out to the parents, we can reach out to the families and say that, you know, this is across the country, they are requiring it, they're mandating it. Um, I think if, if we make a case for it and say, you know, this is the option, if you are coming to school, um, we are going to require everyone to wear masks. And again, as uh, Mike alluded to, if I'm in my office uh, behind my door, I take my mask off. Mm -hmm. But for the rest of the day, it might be 8 hours, 10 hours, 12 hours, we are wearing our masks. I wonder, on the surveys, if, if we ask that question, change, if they knew that mm -hmm. you were going to make the masks mm -hmm. optional. Well, if this is what the board wishes, this is could. just my my opinion. Right. I, I agree. But we could that. add that because the next layer, or the next phase, if you will, would be again reaching out to every family and having that family select option A or B for its student, and in option A, physical learning, we could easily ask or easily state that if you choose this option, your child will be required to wear a mask. Because I, I kind of agree. I, I feel like easier to me to require high schoolers <coughs> to wear it and maybe middle schoolers. Maybe, I don't know if elementary school kids is a different group. Those study. are the people you would encourage or you try to... Uh, yeah, maybe you encourage kids, them kids, to require... Kids to keep it on. We were chatting earlier to say, or to say maybe you give high schoolers if you weren't going to make it mandatory let them have seventh that we're off three days a week or something if you wear a mask the rest of the day. But if we're already giving them Friday off, I guess I, that's not <laughs> that makes sense. I, well, the okay. question I have for you to, um, or, you know, Dr. McKenna too, mm -hmm. is let's say we don't make it, we make it mandatory, but we say we're very clear about if you are within six feet or you are in proximity, then you wear it, or is it because of the aerosol no, no, potential? No, no. You, That's what you, I wonder. I if, you're, if, you're in a, if you're in a closed environment, then you keep it on. So you're saying that the teachers shouldn't even be able to take it off in their if classrooms you, if, if they're you, alone. That's that's where I was alluding to. Right. So they shouldn't. Be, not not when they are with other people. Okay. If you're if you're prepping on Friday or Monday or Wednesday, whatever day they are by themselves, that's a different right. story. Yeah. But when you are talking, when mm -hmm. you are singing, right. when you're you know you have a music class or mm -hmm. choir class, mm -hmm. um, right. when are they going to be singing? How are they going? Mm -hmm. You know, your the aerosols are out there, your droplets are going out there, that's how you spread it. Right. Whereas if you're outdoors or an open room like this, less chance of it traveling, but in closed environments. Uh, that makes it difficult. And now, you know, now the new requirements are coming out that rather than cloth masks, they're pushing more for surgical masks in uh, hospital environments and everywhere else. Even if you're in non-patient care areas, you cannot use uh, cloth mask anymore going forward from next week. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at a situation like that, I, I'd be reluctant to have um, hundreds of kids return to school with the option of mm -hmm. not wearing their masks, mm -hmm. potentially putting other children, there might be children in there who might have poorer immune systems or they might have mm -hmm. some other underlying health conditions. We should not be putting them at risk. You certainly make the teachers feel better. Right. The kids it, 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 everyone, everyone around feels mm -hmm. safer coming to an environment where everyone is doing their part to protect people around mm -hmm. them. And the I'm second thing I have a concern is about the screening. I do not think I'd go with the self-screening. I would still, I liked it that you had a thermometer out there to take my temperature when I walked in. Um, at our hospital, we have it that the, any time of the day or night you come in, they take your temperature. Even if I'm on call tonight, if I go in at midnight, I have to stop there and you have to get your temperature taken. And you get a band that we wear if you have to go back in mm -hmm. to the hospital. So having something like that, uh, instead of just seeing a monitor at home, I don't know if I'd have the time in the morning if I have two or three little children and I have to get to work, I can just uh, sign it or say, yeah, the kid was fine. 
Yeah. You know, do I just uh, test that forehead well, and? And that's like at our office where we were originally when we were coming in the driveway, we'd stop at the guard shack, and somebody would come up, take your temperature, mm -hmm. say, okay. Well, now you go inside the building, you stand in front of a camera, you look well, at you the computer scan screen, thing. it scans it, and within three seconds you're on your mm -hmm. way to your desk. But it also keeps a computerized record of your temperature and mm -hmm. of your facial recognition. Mm -hmm. So Big Brother is watching. Cool. I understand. Well. Dr. Deep, did I hear you correctly <clears throat> that all students then should have their temps taken upon entering? If, if everyone who enters the school should be. Anyone and everyone who enters the school, you need to have someone who it doesn't take long to just check their temperature if they're uh -huh. over that 100.4 or 100.3, whatever your cutoff is. You just tell them to move aside, make sure that they have a mask on while uh, someone addresses that, or your school nurse does while the other children and the teachers go through the line. So even the high school? No. Because we, on yes. the proposal, no, we don't. Everywhere. Everywhere okay. you should, because yeah. okay. I, we did I, I wouldn't feel talk about that, and then we moved away to mm -hmm. just elementary and jump in any of you who were at that meeting mm -hmm. because of the possible bottleneck of kids waiting in it line. It might. Yeah, but I, I just don't think if I could just, um, it also is there any likelihood that before September 1st we'll have guidance from either the, the State Department of Health or from DPI? You know, it seems like when you think of how political mask wearing that, you know, are, is Antigo doing this in isolation from other communities, and, and what are your colleagues saying mm -hmm. about, about I don't you say even the president was advocating masks today, you know, at 5 o'clock. So far, everything has been um, deferring to local health departments, and in terms of mask wearing, the only one who, in, um, as of last Friday, so the only one who had planned to mandate it is Rhinelander. Um, others were going with the strongly encouraged or um, the higher, the high school students and not elementary. Patrick, what was your five cents on last? Yeah, you know, as we talked about in the bigger meetings, I, I think everyone should wear a mask as much as possible. And then you have to weigh that against the, the pushback you'll get from strong mandates. You'll have some students that will say, I get panic attacks and anxiety when I wear a mask. So we'll have to address ways to deal with that. You might have, you know, there's a variety of, you know, the more coercion we use, the more you spend capital. So I, I strongly believe in masking. I wear it everywhere when I'm out and about. I strongly believe everyone should. We definitely want to approach it in a way where we get high amounts of utilization without too much blowback from people. Mm -hmm. Now, actually, the community, you know, the fact that Pick and Save and Walmart have expanded their requirements, that's helpful for us, mm -hmm. and that may continue. You know, so it may be that momentum is just moving that way anyway, and we'll be very fortunate and, and require that. And we may want a contingency for students that have sensory disorders and things, yeah. and maybe face shields. They're not, yeah. they're certainly not perfect, but face shields plus some distancing can be can certainly provide some measure of risk reduction. Mm -hmm. Dr. can you just repeat what you said about cloth face mask? I thought you said there was a difference in dot of effectiveness. In the hospital settings now they are mandating the surgical masks. I see what you're wearing. These are the surgical masks that are now being required by all staff, whether they are in patient contact or not. Whereas for us, on patient contact, we have to mask and wear a face shield. Okay. We're talking cloth masks here, right? Yeah. That's what the state's providing? Yes, the state is providing cloth. Right, right. That, that's where I was going Reusable. to see <coughs> change in that recommendation and now render those. Absolutely. And you know, when you talk about cloth, certainly like in, a, in a, there are certain settings where, I mean, it would be a hospital setting you have, I mean, it's mm -hmm. just required. You know, the, the practicalities and realities of masks and expenses and and that in the broader setting i mean we know that cloth masks are not perfect but we know that they do reduce transmission so so i think they're still very helpful i mean this is what i typically wear when i'm out and about is my cloth um, it's probably less helpful for reducing 
personal transmission, probably more helpful for reducing spread if I'm sick From me to you. and moving it forward. So, so it's, it's all part of how do we mitigate risk while meeting people kind of where they are in this process. And that's, that's really where my question for you guys came was, let's say we make it mandatory. However, we have to have, I don't want to get into the punishment phase of kids not wearing masks and, and I, because they're stressed out enough as they're coming yeah. in. And so being able to have flexibility in our policy where, okay, you go take a break, Johnny, by yourself over here and mm -hmm. take a few seconds to, that's all I'm saying is how much flexibility do we have if we say we mandate but then we use our discretion based on what we know about. I, I what think we you want a high doing. degree of flexibility because you're right, and then you'll get parental blowback, you know, and potentially those things can spiral, um, and then all of a sudden a mandate becomes untenable. Well, so. we want to do positive. We talked about that, JD, talking about positive reinforcement and offering like incentives and all of that um, for kids to wear masks. Even if we make it mandated, we could still do those yeah, things. Exactly. Right? So, but preparing them ahead and you know yeah. if, if this is mm -hmm. the way to go yeah. we have we have several weeks now to prepare the mm -hmm. students and the families about this and maybe so that just, would be a mm -hmm. so if you're going to say we're going to require you to wear a mask unless and unless i don't know except some special i got it one teacher you know saying it might be hard for some of the special ed kids so i don't know if that's like the, the hearing the the and we're going to do like face yeah. shields. We've got kind of a plan, like all of that, with regards to students with special needs. I just don't want them yeah. to make a choice right. to stay home because their kid can't make a can't wear a mask. And so, I I know that's yeah. not what you were saying. So is that our discipline? Like if you won't wear the mask, you now have to do remote learning. Well, I think I like Dr. Deep. But you have an option. Ahead you of have time. an option ahead yeah. of time. Let them know yep. that you know. You can start practicing with the children at home, you know, mm -hmm. almost everywhere you are seeing those cloth masks, you go to Dunham's, you go to Menard's, you go to Fleet Farm, they're selling those masks, or many places they're giving them out. Mm -hmm. So at least, you know, try figuring it out if, if you are comfortable with it, if your child is. If you wear it in front of your child, your child will, will watch you and they'll wear it. Mm -hmm. Trying to get them used, and, and if, if the parents feel strongly against it, then you have the remote option. They're not depriving them of the education, but at the same time, what if the child that they are seeing, they don't want them to wear it, could also be the one who's at potential risk of getting a bad infection, would be feel good about it if that child came to school and got infected. Yeah, and realistically, we want to put a plan in place that's going to be safe for the staff, safe for the students. Absolutely. And uh, I don't know if anybody and, and the families that they go back. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody doesn't want their kids back in the building mm -hmm. because I, I think it, that's the kind of environment everybody's used to, and we've had a disruption now for the better part of eight months or thereabouts. Yeah, let, let's if we're going to put a plan in place, let's make it as safe as possible as we can for everybody. And if wearing masks is part of that, so be it. Yeah, I think there are people who don't want their kids back in the building if we, you know, if 95% of people are not, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I should say, they want 95% of people wearing a mask. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I saw a news report just, just the other day where some firm over in Marshfield is making uh, masks for different mascot or for different schools. And they'll right. silk screen them and making them available. As a matter of fact, what I saw they were doing for Ryland. So maybe for the grade school kids or something, you give them the opportunity to mm -hmm. give them a mask yeah. and have them decorate it and personalize mm -hmm. it up for themselves and make it part of a project. We actually have a couple of staff that have come forward <clears throat> just today saying we have this idea to involve community partners as well mm -hmm. to make masks. Okay. To to do that okay, exactly. so we will amend that, if I'm hearing correctly, mm -hmm. to say that students will be required to wear masks as well. And then... Um, the K, or what if, and, but, I don't think we have to put the exceptions no. up. Yeah, I mean, for no, K3, but K3 is going to be strongly encouraged to not... Yeah. They're the ones going home to their grandparents, though. I mean, if well, you talk about... Yeah, my, my kid's been at daycare the last three months in a row, you know, not wearing a mask, but he's four. Right. But I'm just saying to your point, mm -hmm. who's really being watched by their grandparents. The younger kids may not have as much of an affliction to catch the virus, yeah. but they can spread it. Yeah. So are you saying we want to try to do them mandatory also? Do you think we yes. can get the kids to wear them? 
What was it that Mrs. Blood said several months ago? What's Kids that? usually that adapt massive? easier and quicker. Oh, oh yes, they do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not like it just started two days ago. I mean, you know, a lot of right. kids have been wearing yeah. masks. Well, the question I have about the temperature taken here is what about those students that are riding the bus? If they have a temperature over 100, they have already been on that bus for a period of time. Is there a way that we can partner with Tim and Maliette where the bus drivers are actually taking temperatures? I know the company that I work for, we do that oh, now. Okay. Uh, the drivers take their temperatures, and if, if they have a temperature over 100, uh, they send okay. them right off the bus and back into the house. That's a great idea. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. How, how because much do those thermometers run for? Those? I can find out tomorrow. The question is about the cost of the thermometers. $70. Yeah, I, I think they're well under 100 so, bucks. Yeah. Tim, do we know... The state is sitting on a pile of CARES money. Do we know if we're going to get any of that? We are through um, a title allocation, and that's how we provided the one-to-one, -one, if you remember that. I know that they've got some additional funds that they haven't really allocated. But I thought they were putting some money aside for the thermometers and masks. and was we're, getting, we're getting eight the thermometers, thermometers that we currently have that you use. Um, I purchased, they caught, or the school district purchased, and they cost eighty to ninety dollars a piece. Oh. So how many buses we got? We got, we the school district so far purchased twelve, and then the the um, state is sending us eight as well. Right. So, so I, have, I also have a question about like Mike. I don't know what they do at your work, but. If you get a temperature and it's close to the, mm -hmm. or at it, do they just have you go home or do they wait 10 minutes and take it again? No, you go out to the parking lot and you sit in your car for 10 minutes and you turn your air conditioning on and chill out and then you come back in and they take it again and if it's still up, then you go. Right. So, so you're checked a second time. I mean, I don't know what we're doing about that as far as if on we're going to do it at the bus. Well, yeah, that's a good idea to, idea to do it on the bus, but I don't know if you're going to offer that, like, okay, parents, if you take their temperature again in 10 minutes and it's okay, you could bring them to school and have them take their temperature, but, you know, I don't know. Yeah, I think the other thing is if the bus driver gets a kid with a high temperature, um, can, can he send them back in or are their parents already left for work? You know, because I think there's yeah. parents who say, well, the bus is coming in 15 minutes, I'm going to work. Well, I think if you let them know we're taking temperatures on the bus, they yeah, can get that right. it's, that it's all education. Well, that, that would be plan. something that you have to send out ahead, saying that yeah. going forward, right. please check your uh, children's uh, temperature in the morning when you wake up, and if they are high, please do not get them ready for school, because their temperatures will be taken when they get on the bus and when they get into school, and uh, if they fall out, then uh, we will have to contact you to come pick them up. Mm -hmm. To a certain extent, you know, I wouldn't say we're not overreacting, but we're trying to do everything we can to get as many Absolutely. kids in school it's, as we it's, can. it's not something that people will like, but mm -hmm. it's again for the greater good. You know, if you're trying to keep the majority safe and it's going to inconvenience one or two people. It's the new normal. It is. It is. Mm -hmm. Whatever the normal is. But Okay. Is it? Will all students then, you're thinking, will be checked for temperatures at the high school and the middle school? Or is that just... That, that is what I'm hearing, yes. So if we mm -hmm. can find a way to um, have kids cleared before they have a bus ride, and then they do ride the bus, they could enter without being checked, of course. And then that would help us limit the lines and the entrances for others but we'll need staff to man that and we'll need um, a system for we'll figure that out a system for recording actually we'd only need to record those who are running a tent we don't mm -hmm. have to record the others okay hey, hey. Can you read that? I don't know. Max said something about what if the parents are not. Um, I need to move this so I can get into it. If you, uh, Amy or Clint or Rachel, you guys, you think we're going to make your lives better like this or more miserable <laughs> having to try to have you guys get kids to wear masks? Yeah, parents are 
parents are not going to be appreciative that we're on the same page. But there will be so families that, that, that the parents are, don't choose to have a certain location where they have to come back. So, but if they have a different option, I think that that's also positive, too. Right. Um, as far as the screening upon entry, um, I don't know if that's something that Four more thermometers we need, one at every entrance for every grade level, you know, thinking through the logistics of it right away. So I don't think it's impossible. I think what we just need to keep planting as a seed with our families and our staff and ourselves is that this year is just going to be different. And it might be inconvenient, it might be challenging, it might not be what we're accustomed to, but until we really know more, we just have to be safe. Yeah, I think part of the education should be that, you know, Langland County, for whatever reason, we have very low numbers, and we have the potential to keep them there, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, as opposed to other places that had very low numbers and have turned that around. Mm -hmm. We talked about at one of the health departments when we met, just the, the fact that we're going to have inefficiencies mm -hmm. in our system but they are worth keeping kids. You know, the benefit we're gonna, at lunchtime, at, you know, all these things, there's gonna be things that we're just gonna have to do um, to mitigate. So at the bottom of this slide, then, we will have protective barriers, but only in the school's main offices. Um, smaller schools may have them for individual desks, and um, we thought we'd have other options there and then the new norm I just heard someone say it so things like social distancing hand washing sanitizer and outdoor learning um, ventilation is huge as you'll hear later and so if possible we'll get kids outside uh, routinely and if we're saying we're having mandating masks would that be for outside too or not mm, there's a question um, Outside is different, and it does, it is more risk. It perhaps would, you know, it's worth getting granular about that and trying to decide. I would say it's not always necessary if you're in kind of close quarters with people. But if you're playing a spaced out game or doing something more spaced out, it may not be necessary, but I, you know, it depends on, I would say, you know, probably emphasizing mass and then if people are good at kind of those things, then you know, reducing you know, the frequency of mask wearing. In the winter, it'll probably be easier because if it's cold, you can wear things to protect your face, and those would be adequate for little kids and things. Well, Patrick, I think of football, and when the two lines line up against each other, I don't think of that as a spaced out affair. Well, you know, WI, I mean, I. I don't know what WIA has. I was just trying to look at their guidelines today, see if they've updated. Um, 24th, I believe, the next update comes. Yeah, so I don't know what they're going to do. I mean, I, I think close contact sports are high risk. Mask wearing is probably really appropriate um, in those circumstances. Should they even be played? That is a really good question. Well, I mean, even the NFL and college football is trying to figure yeah, I didn't mean to think of it as high school football. I, I'm thinking of uh, in gym class yeah. or in uh, the playground, um, the playground where kids are just playing games where they are actually in close contact. They should, they should wear masks. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm of the mind, if you're going to tell them, it, I think it's more confusing to be like, well, but you can this time yeah, exactly. and not that time. And then also it just happens so quick. Kids will run up to another kid and you're mm -hmm. in close contact. But also I'm wondering... Um, along with other inefficiencies, if it's not um, something that we want to do, you know, depending on the grade level, but um, educating the students about wearing masks. I've seen many a beautiful chin guard in my day, and <laughs> it's, it's not correct. It, it needs to be over your nose. You don't need to pull it down to talk. You don't, mm -hmm. you know, they need to. <laughs> well, we need to model the their behavior. Right. Yeah. You know, the teachers and. Yeah, we do, but that means they see them. If, if you keep push, uh, pulling it down when you're talking or sitting there, everybody else will say, well, you know, my teacher does this, so it's probably okay. There yeah. are many times that we 
walk in and you have patients sitting there and they go, well, am I supposed to wear this? I'm like, <laughs> I don't. gee, yeah, <laughs> it was not just something to yeah. take home. People are like, <laughs> yeah. wear it. And yeah. this yeah. is how you wear it. It's, really left, but it's every single day and it's like, oh, I forgot my mask. Do I have to wear it? And Oh, I'll just be careful. I'm like, what are you going to be careful with? I'm like, forget it. I'm like, yeah, I think I saw somebody at the post office trying to do this <laughs> yeah. when they walked in. Yeah, they come out and cough and um, Tom said you. the WIAA is meeting 9 o'clock on Thursday. So oh, interesting. Okay. okay, so the next slide um, goes back to transportation and we're prepared. Mm -hmm. um, Maliette will, of course, work with us, but we're prepared to tell families that we encourage them to consider transporting their own children that would be safer than riding a bus. And um, children would be required to wear a face covering and we'll add the temperature piece there. And we are also prepared, I don't want it to be a one and done, but it may have to be for the time being, that we will not offer in city transportation because that adds, you know, population to ridership, if you will. So. If we have to reduce student numbers on the bus, that's the easiest way to do it. Since we are obligated to provide transportation to, to students who reside two miles and more. That's what we'll go back to for the time being. So what I learned today is um, even more unique, and I, and I would not suggest we go there. Because our district has a city, and all of our schools reside within the city. There's a little clause that says we are not required to provide transportation as long as all of those schools are within the city. So we could set the limit. When we look at transporting ch children, we have 25 regular routes. Transport them safely under the guidance of under COVID, we would need 54 routes. So that's including the city kids. That's including the city kids. So, you know, we, we could go to the point where we, we could say um, two miles, four miles, five miles and closer parents for transport, and that would still be within the statutory requirements of transporting students for animals. So let me ask you this, maybe we've got to jump back a step. In the classroom, how far apart are we going to try to keep kids wearing masks? So they have feet. to be six feet all the time. So in theory, we'd be trying to accomplish something similar on the bus. Yeah, and, and when you look at the, it's interesting that AAP um, guidance suggests three to six feet, um, you know, and doing the best you can. Does it make you feel better taking temperature? Like, is, how possible is it to have this and not have a high temperature? Um, it is still possible, <laughs> but it is a, it, all of these things are mitigation measures, so everything does help. Another measure that we've talked about with buses that I think is important is opening the windows. Mm -hmm. um, even in the winter, all the windows can be opened a little bit or quite a few of them. Yeah. Now, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. but, but that's plus, okay. Plus, yeah. Yeah. I agree completely. Kids will talk about when they're old about how they had to ride on a bus with all their windows down. Minus 30. Yeah. In 2020. You <laughs> still understand how great you have it. And it was uphill both ways. Yes, yeah. literally. Yeah. Yeah. So we can we can encourage. What I worry a little bit about is um, the compulsory nature of providing transportation. So if we encourage parents and we say, please drive your children to school, what do we do with the parent that says, no, I want to get paid for that drive? I, I'd be more. I don't. I don't know if. I would say that would happen so much as let's say like if you're going to ask parents to bring their children to school but they're going to say okay but I have to work at 7 a.m. or I have to work at 9 a.m. like is that going to be okay will there be some place to leave my child or I think that would be more of a barrier than worrying about and then on the back side I have to work until five or six mm -hmm. right yeah. And that brings up a good point. We were not considering hosting um, after school, they after right, school. those what I would call non-essential yeah. clubs, even Robin's Nest, which was popular last year and it was a great benefit 
to our parents, but um, just for safety reasons, to have better control mm -hmm. of who's in the building when. So masks on the bus, that's applied? Tim, do you remember how many masks the state is sending us to start with? 4,000. 4, so, so essentially double. And those are the washable ones. So we will only be able to give the students likely two each? We're also ordering 20,000 more, though, of the non-cost. Of non I, I received them today. We oh, you four, did? We have okay. 40,000 of these. Oh, okay. cool. So we know. should have plenty. Well, I mean, just because you're technically supposed to wash these after one use, <coughs> one day. So those kids got to go home. So now mom and dad have to make sure they wash that that day. They might have one day leeway if they get a second mask. But And to be honest, that's not something we can enforce. Mm -hmm. If they don't wash it, yeah. we would never mm -hmm. know. Well, yeah. but I'm. And I think if we get it masking be. broadly, and it's broadly accepted, and you've won a huge battle. Absolutely. You know, and, and washing them really is about primarily about protecting yourself, you know, because you're trying not to touch and then like infect. So while that is ideal, that is definitely ideal, you know, if you can get masks going broadly, um, you've gotten a big way for you. Well, and there's a number of retail outlets now that are handling them. Mm -hmm. uh, Walmart the other day, five pack by Ames is $7.50. So there's plenty of retail places where families can literally go in and pick up extra masks. It's not, yes, it's our responsibility to provide them some, but in the same vein, it's also part of the family's responsibility to help take care of themselves. It is, but you should expect that there's families that I'm like, I'm not wearing a mask, and if, they, mm -hmm. if they're going and they have to, then the district better provide masks. Yeah, no, so. But I think, Jessica, there will be more kids um, so we had all our employees wear masks during dairy season, uh -huh. and we bought masks for them. Uh, but mm -hmm. we said, you can bring your own cloth mask if you want. Sure. And I would say 60 or 70 percent of them did that because they didn't, they had a mask that fit, they liked it, that's what they wore. I would expect that of the older kids, yeah. And I, I'm trying to find, you know, if you look around, everybody's got a little different homemade or <coughs> store bought and whatever. I'm going to try and find as many varieties as I can. There's some children size masks out there and have at least the, you know, 100 or 200 of a variety and, you know, do the best we can to provide an option. You know, I'm sure one of them is going to take off and then we're not going to have any of those. So then we'll, we'll, we'll have to fight through it, but I'll try and get as many. Hold on, from China. <laughs> Maybe another How district, Jake, not here. They just gave us another one. Yeah. Amazon, there's one more. I never even thought of parents would try to ask for money to get their kids to school. So you're saying we provide the busing from that mile? Our campus is what Dr. Sprague talked about. Anybody with this kind of a mile or two miles or whatever that is, that's going to be able to get their kids to school. So that's but what I learned today is because we've always had rural schools, we've mm -hmm. had kids attending all over. But all of our schools are now in the city, and there's a little, for whatever reason, bigger cities had mass transit mm -hmm. available, so they weren't required to uh, transport their students. So, you, Kim, you're saying that even a kid who lives out in Gleason were not yeah. required to bus them? I mean, that sounds like a bad idea. Obviously, we have to bust the <laughs> I, I want to review the statute exactly, but that's, that's what it appears to be. Doesn't sound like a very nice thing to do. Right. No. But it would surprise me if it was something nice. But even under the best conditions, to think that we're going to be three feet away on a bus. Right. So we might not going to happen. Or we make a right. sacrifice there. So that's how you just maybe you're okay three feet in the classroom, too, when we're going to say, you think we can even get three feet apart on a bus? And, well, you know, Dr. McKenna and I talked about this a little bit. If you look at buses now, they have much higher back seats. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, the children, you know, the tops of their heads you can't are see them. Over. Mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't even see over them. If you're well, you put that plexiglass or plastic or whatever behind the seats, that gives you the protection. Well, and even the seat itself may mm -hmm. protect, do some protection. <coughs> okay. Food services next. Sarah Dubor is still investigating. She too sent a communication today uh, that I 
received after sharing this. So um, it is likely that students will eat in classrooms or other areas that limit the number gathered in one spot for social distancing. We thought that we would also have to serve prepackaged foods and things that aren't um, touched by other people, but I did read enough to know that um, her organization is suggesting ways that we can still serve hot lunch as an offering and have it be safe. But it's basically disposable containers mm -hmm. and silverware. Right. Yes, yeah. or the she talked about purchasing carts too. So if there is a tray that needs to be washed and sanitized, kids would be the only ones to touch their tray. They would put it on the cart then right in the classroom so they don't have to leave or... So now are kids going to have opportunity to sanitize their desk before they eat if they're in the classroom? Mm -hmm. Well, we didn't talk about that. So there, and it, it, this continues to change a little bit, but the general consensus right now that I hear is that it's, it's not recommended to have students use disinfectants for safety purposes. Okay. Um, Teacher? But, but, if the parents, <laughs> Teacher. but if the parents send their uh, little hand sanitizers or wipes, is that okay? Yep. Well, the wipe is the same disinfectant as what we would spray, so they would suggest no. I, I Wipe's I really, okay. Yeah, I really think that that's probably going to evolve and change a little bit as we get closer because just the reality of how that's going to look, that's probably the least risk to have students help in that, but it, everything I hear is it gets very tricky legally yeah. when we place disinfectants in children's mm -hmm. hands. Yeah, well, maybe not the children, but I'm just thinking. Teachers, absolutely, the, the plan, and I'll, I'll yeah. cover this more at the meeting, uh, committee of the whole, um, each room will have a large bottle of sanitizer and a large bucket of 450 disinfectant wipes. So, yeah. And when we think about coronavirus, too, I think, I mean, as Dr. Deep mentioned, really primary means of transmission is through respiratory droplets, through transmission through fomites, which is touching surfaces, it is lower risk. And to mitigate that, really, I would say hand washing before lunch, hand washing after lunch is really appropriate. And don't touch and your that's face. a really good way to do it. If you can do soap and water, that's the best. This but the alcohol mask is also the great. The mask actually keep you from touching your face. <laughs> The um, next page has legal updates related to student, not student absences as much as staff absences. Um, Melanie Ryan has been trying to keep up with all of that. I met with Melanie and Tim again today. As we interpret it, we'll share information with all employees. Um, we had a, another call in to an attorney today just to make sure we're on the right track. But we know that everyone is in the same boat. It was when you hear an attorney say, well, you know, just be cautious if you. So it's not a yes or a no, you can't do that. Um, Did but you want me to open these, Julie? Caution. Or these are just for their, you don't need to, me to open these links? Correct. Okay. But they are included there if you would like to read them. Okay. I think the only thing that, that I'd like the board to know on this is that we don't qualify for the um, tax breaks because we don't file a corporate tax return. So the um, additional leave allowed under the CARES Act, it's actually the family's first act, um, would be addition to our normal leave. And we, at this point, don't have a way to get reimbursed for that additional week. So it makes it tough for public schools. The recommendations that we've shared tonight um, in large part come from our meetings with local health officials and staff members who've attended. Um, Dr. McKenna did share with us the user-friendly Harvard School for Health um, which you have linked in there in case you'd like to read it in part or in its entirety. And then I just listed some bullet points that will certainly keep
keep at the forefront of reopening. And the other one that CESA 9 superintendents highly recommended was the American Academy of Pediatrics Guide, and as did their attorneys. So that is linked there as well. So it's really what you've heard tonight is a compilation of local ideas with local input, but also broader than we are. In fact, the motion that I'll share with you momentarily, um, we borrowed in part from Stevens Point. So again, our primary goal is that well-being of students, families, and staff. And we believe that by giving families an option for face-to-face -face or remote learning in the fall really aligns with this goal and provides for the dozens of variables that not only our student families will face, but our staff families. And I, I think it goes back to the mask idea, so I'm really glad the board uh, weighed in on that. We have to consider our staff families as well because we talked today about a personnel shortage. If we have staff who cannot report to work, be it because of quarantine or something else, what is our plan then? If we have more students by chance reporting on a given day, then we have staff to man. So we have to um, really keep their needs um, in mind as well. So later in this meeting, you'll see the proposed motion, which will include the caveats that you decided here this evening about students wearing masks, about temperature taking prior to getting on the bus, about, I wrote them down, um, so they won't all be listed in the motion per se, but they will be included in the rollout plan. So it would simply be that we ask you to approve the reopening schools plan for fall as presented and this is the part that we borrowed from Stevens Point and other districts. And grant the authority to the superintendent or her designee to modify said plan as necessary. And of course, doing my best and our best to keep you in the loop. But if, for example, um, oh, I don't know, there is information that comes from the health department like it did in the fall. and. Um, or, Doc, or Governor Evers and his health officials that said we have to close, then you would give me that authority to close without calling a board meeting. That's what that is intended to me. I just uh, I looked on YouTube. There's actually 180 people actually watching us. How about hands. that? So they were not too happy with our math decision. <laughs> If somebody gets it in the classroom, yeah, what, what our rough plan is for the, that. Yeah. So Clint just shared with me a beautiful team. outline um, flowchart. Darlene has shared mm -hmm. some. We would defer to our um, health officials who would tell us the who and the how long and, I mean, would you know, you think, for, would we keep a class home for a couple of days or would we? Possibly. It depends on the, the circumstances. It would depend on degree of contact, I would imagine. Exactly as you say, the circumstances. If I can, if I can interject with that, I talked with public health and got their input on this, and, and what the recommendation is, um, if there is a student who is positive, um, the only person that will be isolated on, until we get the test results is the student. Once we get a test results, then they will go into secondary screening. Who did the child have close contact with two days prior to onset of symptoms? Um, so, and that's where the school district will be coming in. Um, hopefully we will be um, having the parents sign an agreement that we can give that information, the close contact, contact information to public health. But what it is is, if they, if, if there's a student, we send them home, we will send them home with, with guidelines and it will specifically state, we are recommending, we know that they're having these symptoms, we recommend you contact the family physician for further direction. Um, if they get tested, 
only the person who is getting tested needs to be isolated. Once they are positive, they will continue to monitor and isolate. Close contact household members will, be, will also be asked at that point to isolate. Once the positive person or the person who is ill um, meets the criteria for recovery, which is at this point 72, 72 hours without medica uh, fever free without medication, and respiratory symptoms are improved, and it's 10 days since onset of symptoms. That's when all the other household members start for a 14 day monitoring. So there, there's a potential families will be out of school for up to a month. Um, public health will, will certainly be involved at that point and be giving them direction. Um, if, there, if someone is deemed a um, close contact, then all close contact people will be encouraged to get a COVID test within three to five days. However, a negative reading does not negate being able to just say, okay, I'm negative and I can go back to school. If they are negative, they still need to stay home for the four, full 14 days and monitor their symptoms. If they have a fever, or if they are negative, if it's ne if if they're having symptoms, but their COVID test and their close contact, which again is 15 minutes, um, you know, having 15 minutes in close contact with somebody with or without a mask. It's usually without a mask. Yeah, but yes. if they've got if they're deemed as close contact. They are encouraged to get a test, but just because it's negative doesn't mean they can just come back to school. But they have is, to stay home for the full 14 so, days. So, so these are the close contacts of a confirmed case, right? This is the, this is of the, of the, the um, confirmed case. Okay. If we send a student home and they do not get tested, the parent decides we're not going to do it, the child the only one who's got the symptoms is the only one who needs to be self-isolated because we don't have a positive to go off of. So but they will be out of school for what, 14 days? No, they'll be out of school for the same criteria, 72 hours without a fever, without medication, and improvement of respiratory symptoms, and it's been 10 days since onset of symptoms. So they go by the same criteria. Um, the only other thing that um, um, close contact and public health will use, if a close contact does not have symptoms, they will also look at 10 days from the date of last contact with the person who had the positive test. But that would be all under the purview of the health department because once you have a positive case, Darlene, <coughs> correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought they did the contact tracing yes. through the county health department. Yes. That's Once, not something that is your obligation or the school district. Correct. The only thing that we we talked about as far as school obligation, and again, hopefully, I sent some information to Julie today about a possible. It's almost like a disclaimer by by giving signature. Um, it, it explains what COVID is and what the test, what the procedure is, and what what um, contact, um, close contact means. And then it just outlines that if we have a student who tests positive, and we have students who um, are identified as close contact, to expedite public health ability to reach out to the families and start the contact tracing, the school, want, I, we need to be able to release name, address, names of all of the secondary people in the house or other people in the house, and email address if necessary. Um, I do think for HIPAA purposes, we do need a signature before we release that information. I'm not sure. I, I'm thinking we probably do. No, if it, if it is a public health issue, I don't think that you would well, be... Well, you don't think so? I... The school is going to be releasing it. It's not that, the public health. That, that would be something that I would probably um, check with public health, darling, because uh, once you, this is like this is a public health issue. Once you have a confirmed case, they have the right to 
contact trace and they can get in and they will they will okay. look at it i do not believe that you will have to provide that information to them well the the reason we were going to do is because here at the school if we had a student in in a certain cohort uh -huh. we know everybody that student's been in contact with so we would just run off that information fax it over they've got that information and they can start their contact tracing um the school will be you know we're just going to do a lot of communication back and forth um, can you please check with the health department on that before we yeah before, I will. I'll before we start sharing that information I am a little and if for social distancing in a classroom would that be considered close contact still if you're in the room if you're in close because contact. it's longer than right 15 you, you do not know if the if they are going to be in the room and yeah. if you are having lunch in the room like you said you are going to take your right. okay. masks off for that half hour or whatever time that yep. you're eating lunch okay which is, which I think also why we're working to cohort students as much as possible. Right, that way you don't have to go tra tracing to hundreds of students. Exactly, tracing you exactly. have the same 20 or 30 or 40 kids. Exactly. Yeah. So was your question whether she had to get permission from the parents to release the information or that we could just release it because I, of I, public health? I don't think we condition. need to go to that extent of releasing. I'm thinking it's incumbent on public health to solicit mm -hmm. that information. Sure, but we and we don't want to make that easier for them if we know what cohort they're yeah, in. But I think that's all she was asking. Is that because when she said that you know she'll take a lead and send that information to public health, mm -hmm. I get worried about HIPAA. Okay, well, so or get permission from them. Right. Yeah. I, I think just check with public health if that's a requirement for us to okay. obtain permission from the parents ahead of time to share that information in the mm -hmm. in the situation if that ever happens that we have a confirmed case. Would that be okay? And does public health need that uh, signature or permission in the pay, in the child's file here to share that information? And, and as Heidi said, it's just we're trying to collaborate with them to because if, if we have if you think about close contact, we have 40 kids hit a cohort, and they go home and they and even. Mm -hmm. They start. How many other people potentially would they have to be they have to be contacting? And they contact them every day for 14 days. Um, they will have an email app, email option and a text option for the parents to text in. Um, however, they will get a personal phone call from public health at least every other day, if not every day. So it was just me trying to collaborate with them to kind of help them with the process. So do we get any priority on testing because it's like three to five days? No, it depends on the tier that you're in. If if you're a healthcare worker or a hospitalized patient, then so, you, you so have a 24-hour turnaround. Otherwise, you're right. If you're a tier three or uh, so, we, so teachers right now are a tier, like a you're teacher, a, you're, you're, even you're though they're... You're not in that, that 24 hour turnaround, you're looking at three to five days. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you. We will move on to uh, item B, needlepoint bipolar ionization. All right. So, um, you know, JD had asked last meeting about what we can do to increase the airflow into the building. Um, the, the short answer of that is yes, we absolutely can. Um, right now, with building codes, um, we bring in between 10 and 20 percent fresh air in each one of our air handling units. That's a uh, it varies based on the whole balance of the building and a number of things. So to give you an exact figure. Um, every device is going to be a little different. So I took the values that they're set at right now, and the reason that they're set where they are is to maximize efficiency. Obviously, you all know the heating world is much more difficult and costly than necessarily the cooling world or spring and fall. Um, so that's really when we get to experience or <laughs> positive or negative effects on our heating bills based on how efficiently we can recirculate the heat at least, not necessarily the air always, but reheat units, things like that, with still keeping 
the building up the court as far as fresh air court requirements. <coughs> so if we were to take those values that are between 10 and 20 percent and increase those, I think 20 percent for a conversation, um, if you plug those numbers in now we're bringing in 30 to 40 percent outside air in all those units, um, that would obviously increase the number of times that our building air turns over by 100 percent. Obviously that would be good. Now that comes with a cost, obviously. Um, the projections, and I'll use just the high school um, for now, the average cost of that to do that for a year, and again, primarily most of this cost comes in our heating season, is going to be roughly $22,000. So that obviously is a big number. You take that to the elementary school, that's more like $4,000, okay? Um, that got me talking to a lot of people on what other options are out there that we could improve the quality of the air, but not necessarily just pumping the heat out of the building to bring more fresh air in. Two things kind of came to the surface. One is UV technology. That's a light source that literally kills viruses, bacteria, things of that nature. Um, expensive to install initially, expensive to maintain. The light bulbs have a life uh, expectancy of approximately 9,000 hours, so that's going to be yearly. We'd have to go into all these units and change them. Now, the way UV works, obviously anything that it's going to kill has to pass in front of that light for X amount of time. So when you look at a building to put enough of those devices in so that we're circulating all that air, um, it's a little more cumbersome than <coughs> the bipolar ionization. That's the other option that I came across a lot. Um, what that is, and you know, this is somewhat new technology. Um, it's been out for about 12 years. It initially came on the market for uh, to, to aid in the efficiencies of the coils and the HVAC equipment that we have by keeping them cleaner. Um, the main thought behind it is positive and negative charged ions are emitted into the air system through the HVAC equipment. Those then can attract to any particles or items that are in there such as viruses, bacteria, dust, mold, um, VOCs which is volatile organic compound that are smells basically. Um, they change the, the structure of that item and particularly in the case of SARS which is a very close cousin to COVID as most of you know. Um, it renders, it, it changes the outside of the, the protein layer that allows this to affect the body and it renders it inactive. Now, that's, that's the theory um, and it's been tested. Um, as if you looked at the results, the one test is from a third um, party uh, innovative bioanalysis they did this. Um, the control was a stagnant room with known SARS on the table. After 30 minutes of undisturbed room and this process happening with the air pumping the positive and negative ions in there, they came back in, tested that hard surface, and it killed 99.4% of those viruses. Now, as much with this new COVID, we don't have up-to-date testing on that. Nobody can say that it does that. Um, it suggested that it does due to the close similarities with SARS um, and how it reacts with things like the flu and colds. Um, so it's very interesting from the stance that you don't have to necessarily 
just look at the only defense that we have of putting chemical on everything, but we have another process that could work all day, all night if we wanted to, to help purify the air and get rid of those, not only for this COVID virus, but other issues with air quality. Um, so I guess any, any questions just kind of on the theory, we'll get to kind of the pricing and how we really got to that. This is the this is technology, the idea behind it, it's been around for a while, but well, well, previously years. used ozone, right? It, so there's a, a technology that came out prior to this that made the byproduct was ozone, and that found to be very problematic for particularly people with asthma, things of that nature, can be sensitive. So this is a new technology that they've tested, and it, it's been confirmed it does not create ozone. But it's very similar in theory. Okay, okay. Yep, that's just what I was making sure of. Okay, so why I came <coughs> to this and wanted to your bring this to you make your own is we could you just look at this as one year uh, increase air flow 20%. Um, I, I will have to monitor that throughout the winter. The, the risk that you run, especially when you look at our middle school classrooms and our elementary classrooms, we have events that are very close to the outside air. So as we open that up, we risk freezing up those coils. Okay? So that, that worries me a little bit, and there may be different times of the winter that we might have to draw that back just to keep the heating system operable. So I, I don't know that we can fully run at that 30 to 40 percent outside air all through winter, but theoretically if we did, um, taking the budgetary numbers that we calculated, you take the 22,000 from the high school, 4,000 at each of the middle schools, is another 12, we're at 34. Um, assuming that the middle school is probably a little less efficient, you could say easily 65 to 70 thousand dollars, we would probably have to spend more in heating costs this winter. Okay. So I asked, okay, if, if we do that option, we know our cost, and it's sixty-five thousand dollars that we'll never see back. Okay. If we go with the bipolar ionization, the installed cost for these devices to cover every bit of our spaces, not including central, I didn't go on that road, but the five buildings um, would cost approximately $275,000. Okay. Now, if you take the 65 off, we're still talking $200,000 or more. This is where I'm still trying to find some details. Um, this technology has been around for 12 years, but this theory against viruses and bacteria is relatively newer. The Air Force has really started using it. Um, they've conducted tests. They're gaining ground with this. Um, so I'm trying to call everybody I can and trying to find red flags that say, no, this is smoke and mirrors. I, I'm, I'm not finding that. Which is both a good thing but a bad thing because there's a lot of people that don't necessarily know of it or have an opinion on it. Um, one of the parts that I can't fully ensure through third party confirmation is the focus on energy aspect. And that could play a big role in this equation. Um, Johnson Controls has worked with Focus Energy on, on this. They've installed this at Lakeland High School. I have not been able to confirm with Lakeland if they've seen these rebates, um, but the projection that Johnson is saying with all the documentation that they have from Focus on Energy is that with that $100,000 installation cost of the high school, the Focus on Energy rebate could be $36,000. I'm very skeptical of that because typically with focus on energy, they make you prove your existing cost 
then theorize your cost savings, then they give you a projection, and then they find out what it really is, and it, and it balances off. So without actual comparable numbers, hard numbers that we've spent and saved, I, I'm skeptical to, to believe that. But Johnson Control assures me that focus has support in that. Um, I'll keep digging on that, but nonetheless, what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is, you know, if we look just at the high school, if you take $22,000 in energy that we may spend if we increase the airflow, and the $36,000 that we may get on focus on energy, that pays for over half of the install, almost 60% of the install. Then we have those devices for, you know, the original ones went in 12 years ago, and they're still fully operable. It, does it work just on surfaces, or it works on the air as it's pulled? I can't find an exact test that declares that it has been tested with airborne and, you know, snow and airborne prior, and then testing airborne after. We try to do this in our potato warehouses, just gas them with ozone. We make all kinds of chemicals to disinfect the air to try to stop silver scores from making them look ugly. And they have a really hard time proving it works. Right. I love the idea. How do you guys do the hospital air? Is it just fresh air, or do you try to filter it somehow? I think it's just the. Uh, yeah. And they, they went around looking at ventilation this spring as this was going on. And I think they, they changed the air circulation, what's it, uh, six times an hour or something in the respiratory clinic. And filtration, too. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they use for filtration. So we're, we're at a MERV 8. Um, a MERV is a rating basically on what side particles it will collect. Um, really the recommendation is to get to a MERV 13, but there's some people that say, you know, really you gotta get to that 14 or 15 before you can effectively say that you're really gonna change catching yeah. those viruses. Now, when you look at getting to that restrictive of a filter, you also have to have a system that provides static pressure to support that, otherwise you're gonna have all sorts of problems and it's just not gonna work. So our systems obviously are not designed for that. Probably, you know, healthcare facilities where they're more robust HVAC systems. And they put in the newer floor. ones too, just about five, six, seven years ago. What's that? They put in the newer ones seven, eight years ago with the new hospital, so yep. probably the modern ones a lot easier to change or to Right. get better results. Right. And I'm, I'm not, you know, J.D., and this is exactly what, uh, why I wanted to bring this. You know, we have a lot of knowledge here. There's a lot of theories, thoughts, um, guesses on what may help. But there's a lot of people that don't know. You know, I, I don't know if I'm fully sold on this, and, and that's not ensuring to you as a board, so I'm not trying to stand up here and just say that I'm not sure, but that, that's the reality where we are. And I didn't want to just discard something without talking through it and getting expertise from, you know, certainly my admin team, you guys are board members, and, you know, just talk through it because there's a lot, a lot of things that we don't know. It's ever changing. We still don't know what this really is. Um, I just thought that if we could look at trying to not just literally pour money out the window, it'd be worth having the discussion. Um, you know, I, I still want to do more research on this. You know, the, the point that JD made with, can you actually claim that it's attacking those viruses in the air? I can't find any, any supporting evidence for or against that right now. Um, but I kind of wanted some feedback from, from you guys and, you know, should I, keep chasing this? Should I try and drill in? Is focus, is this focus really a possibility? You know, if it's not, is this likely too, too costly? Is there a lot? There, there may be, you know, do we just look at the smaller things that are less expensive that we can certainly control and are very tangible items and do those things really good, such as wearing masks, such as screening, such as cohorts. You know, those things don't cost us that much money to do very, very well, and maybe doing a few things very well is better than doing a lot of things happening. So, Jake, I was wondering something too, because I was looking at the uh, 
spec sheets on these. And the one unit that does 4800 CFM, um, I mean, it's only, it's less than a foot long and a couple inches high. How many of these alone would you have to put in a high school building to make it effective? So that model is for a unit. The 4800 is in reference to the CFM that I mm -hmm. can support for the unit. So one per unit event, so that would be, uh, just off the top of my head, probably 100 of those by the time you go through the elementaries and the, the middle school. Okay. Um, when you look at the, the other cut sheet that showed more of the bar style, mm -hmm. those are... The ones you, where you can add the sections to them? Yep, you snap it on and, and typically the, the size of the ductwork is relatively uh, proportionate to the CFM. So. If you have a two foot wide ductwork, you put two foot worth of a stick in there that normally will equate to the right CFM for those air handling units. At the high school, we have 14 air handling units, so we'd have 14 of those devices of varying lengths based on the size. Yeah, because it doesn't seem like they take a lot of power or anything no. to operate, so right. I was just curious because looking at them, you're talking about something very small affecting fairly large areas. So. Right. Okay, thank you. Where would the funding come from, you know? Yeah, I certainly don't have it. <laughs> All mind. right. Um, you know, that, that's something that, you know, I think if we think that this is something realistic as far as a, a, a theory and a functionality mm -hmm. wise, you know, I would definitely drill into more and get more hard facts on numbers from primarily focus on energy. Um, things of that nature and, and really put that picture together with you um, or for you with the help of Tim and Julie but yeah I, I don't I don't just have that in my budget right now. I, I'm leaning more towards no at this point in time just because it seems very speculative. I've been aware of the technology for about two or three years now but yeah. um, just to put my feeling out there I, I think it's very speculative and for the amount of money that we're putting into it and, does that include the monitoring? Because you have a hundred systems put in, I can't imagine you guys checking Yeah, so, so we have a uh, um, building automation system through Johnson Control in our buildings already. Um, two of the buildings are on with a different one, but we are tied in as a network with with controlling who can talk to other buildings. So that would be part of the Johnson Control service, I think for the monitoring part of that, sure. so it wouldn't be an added yearly charge or anything like that. Sure. Okay. So, uh, so what you're saying is, you said we have MERV 8 right now? Yep. Okay. So, I see that the um, sheet that Patrick provided us said they um, suggest MERV 13, but only if your system can handle it. But uh, it sounds like the more fresh air we bring in that kind of counters like if if we were just going to recirculate our air we should have that 13 but if not we can't do 13 like the more air we can fresh air we can bring in kind of helps with that so the the 13 would try and take the particulates out of the air right um the other theory on the, not necessarily fresh air that's only on like Primarily when you're looking at trying to be most efficient for heating purposes, that's where you're going to get more inside air going through that filter to get rid of those viruses. You know, you're assuming that typically the outside air doesn't have virus in it, it's fresh air, uncontaminated. So the more fresh air you can bring in, that means the more inside air you can exhaust out taking out those viruses. Last work that the filter has to try and do to catch it, so it's kind of both sure. following. Right, yeah, so then it also talks about controlling the humidity. Yep. This is going to be harder to control the humidity when we're bringing more fresh air in? Yeah. Okay. Yep, it all plays the game. I got an air exchanger in my house and I can never get it to control the humidity. No. Right. right. I guess I mean, I like the idea, Jake, but I feel like a company that big should be able to get a university somewhere to verify mm -hmm. that it kills it in the air and it doesn't take, you know, an hour, it probably takes a long time. You know, I just, I know we've been trying to do it in potatoes for a long time. And we tried UV lights and ozone and 
all kinds of stuff in the air in the buildings and it's really hard. So I would suspect that maybe they can't. So I would be more inclined to spend the money on something we know will have a benefit mm -hmm. and hopefully we'll be done with this in a year. And then, I don't know, try to get that company to prove it though. Because it seems like they'd have something to sell if they could get it to prove and they'd have all these schools who would then... Right. Well, they would have said that FDA has not proved it. Right. And if they... And Harvard's not suggesting it. They're suggesting right. ultraviolet light. But they are suggesting ultraviolet light. Uh-huh. If you can do it, yeah. Is anybody yeah. dying for ultraviolet light or would you rather just turn it outside air? I don't know what <laughs> cancer's going to be. What's that? I don't know what else it could be to. Oh. Okay, so that kind of sounds like uh, a no. We could let Jake drop this unless somebody else has a. But you think the money's were spent on the air, right? I mean, even though we're short budget this year, it's worth twenty thousand more dollars. Would you say twenty two? Yeah, that's at the high school. You know, so it's going to be sixty. Sixty five across the district would be a relative budget number. I mean, to that's not cheap. That's real money. Right? right. Well, we can start out and. We, we can certainly do it until we get the heating season. Right. We can hope yeah, there's a vaccine holes. by January. Yeah, yeah. and that, honestly, if, if I had to make one recommendation, that would have, would have been the one. Let's get into the school year, get through September and October, see where we're at, see if we can find any, you know, if, if I can find some studies that support this, and maybe it becomes a, a, a real thing that we can then talk about. But I just didn't. Feel like this was a decision that I should make on my own, and, and I, you know, the question was there. That's where my research led me, and I just I wanted to put it on the table for you guys. Exploring the options is a good thing. Yeah, it's out there. It's okay. Jim, I'm so sorry. I, I was wondering too. Um, you know, it might be helpful to focus it in areas of highest risk, and that would be areas where you're potentially aerosolizing virus. And I, I, mean, I hate to mention this, bathrooms are probably the highest risk for aerosolization. Um, you know, that can be in feces, and, and I hate to mention that, but um, I didn't know, A, if there's intake going out of bathrooms into other places? No, no there's direct exhaust out of Great. So almost that's every really one good. of my bath yeah. Every one of the bathrooms that I can recall, there may be a special one in one of oh, our LNG awesome. schools that may somehow not, but I, I can say with certain that. And most of the large factors have there. direct exhaust that are controlled by the BAS and any time that the building is unoccupied more, they are running 100% full time. Thanks, man. I guess with that point, Patrick, uh, the other place would be in classroom, you know, maybe in special ed classroom where you're having, struggling to have kids wear a mask. Yeah. Well, Wouldn't. our goal is to do um, Face shields? Face shields, yeah. Yep. Um, so, you know, so, we're going to yeah. do individualized. Okay. Okay, so you know where you're going with that from the board direction? Yeah, we'll crank up the fresh air for the weather friendly months and maybe look into it a little more. Keep, keep digging. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Jake. And we'll go on to uh, number five new business, short term borrowing. Amy, this is normally uh, the time of the year that I come to the board and let them know where we're kind of at with a cash flow position. And, um, you know, further on down in the budget or in the meeting agenda, we'll talk about it in the budget and how that's impacted. But I, um, given all the unknowns over um, this year's, this coming year's budget, um, I guess my recommendation would be to go ahead and do short-term borrowing even if we don't need to tap into it. And um, as an example, when we look at the ESSER funds that we're getting from the CARES Act, we have to make we have to spend the money first and then get reimbursed by the federal government. So um, typically we're going to be cash short in um, November. And um, I think it's prudent that we go ahead and do some cash flow borrowing just to make sure. Um, statutes require that the board approve borrowing by a two-thirds margin. So I, I typically come to you at this time of the year and say, I'd like to start working with the um, Quarles and Brady to prepare those documents and get that arrangement to take care of. Okay, sounds good. Okay. 
Any uh, questions or comments from anybody on that? I still can't believe they make us use a law firm to do it every year. <laughs> Seems like an unnecessary expense for. You know why they do that? Is it really that hard? Well, you know, and part of it, JD, may be um, the, the law firm makes money doing it. And so um, we're complying with the letter of the law. We use Quarles and Brady. Other districts um, might have a handshake agreement with the local financial institution that doesn't necessarily comply with the letter of the law. You know, in, in the big picture, um, having that line of credit, having you approve it, um, it is a very small. I mean, last year I think we spent $3,500 doing it. And last year we tapped into every penny of it. So um, I think it's the worst game in it. But yeah. Okay. I'm mostly just complaining about the standard. <laughs> Not you following it. <laughs> Maybe you're wrong, but I complain about that too. Okay, we will go on to the uh, next item, which is also your Tim. Actually, I'm uh, for the administration contract changes. Okay. So there are some mostly minor, one significant changes we'd like to make in administrative contracts, and not in all of them, but we found discrepancies, which uh, we suspected for a while, so I worked with Melanie and Tim, and... Um, we hammered all of these discrepancies out so that we can change them and find consistency in admin contracts. So, for example, one administrator had no personal days in a contract, so we plan to rectify that. Um, we changed the mileage allowances for two administrators because there were errors there. The vacation language is now the same, so the number of days was the same, but the language was different and allowed for interpretation, so we're cleaning that up. The credit reimbursement amount for all administrators will now be consistent, a consistent amount across the board. And the most significant one um, simply was not sustainable. In fact, the as I learned, the last three administrative administrators the board has approved for hire were not offered a post-retirement health benefit because it isn't affordable. So what we started to do was take a look at what we could offer instead and came up with what the last three admin hired have and that is a TSA to which the district contributes annually. So it would be our proposal then, again, after having talked to all the administrators, we would we plan on grandfathering three in who have the longest tenure, and you know certainly we expect will retire from this district, and um, so that benefit has been there for them since the beginning. Others um, who are not as tenured or only have a like myself, I was not offered that benefit because I'm one of the last three hired. And so I have a TSA. So what we would do is make that consistent across the board. Um, and just wanted you to be aware of that. Tim helped me understand the um, unsustainability um, of long-term carrying that out. We, we simply couldn't afford it. So we thought now was the time to meet with each administrator, make sure they understand the change and forward. So, any questions on that? Okay, thank you. Okay, we will go on to uh, board action items. And uh, item A is consideration to approve athletic trainer services contract with the Spires Langley Hospital. And the board approved the 2020-2021 athletic trainer services contract with the Spires Langley Hospital as presented. Second that. Any questions or comments? And uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Okay, we'll go on to item B, consideration to approve school reopening plan. I move the board approve the reopening schools plan for fall 2020 as presented and grant the authority to the superintendent or her designee to modify said plan as necessary. Seconded. Any questions or comments on this? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, we'll go on to item C, consideration to approve district learning management system. I move the board approve the purchase of the district learning management system as presented. Seconded. Um, okay, any uh, comments on this from administration? Rachel, you were uh, Must have heard your name, though. I need my gym teacher voice, I guess. Um, yeah, so, as you know, we learned a lot of things over the closure, and one of those things was we needed to improve the ability to provide an education remotely. So that's where we got the one-to-one -one devices and the, the Kajit hotspots. And the next thing to do was to think about purchasing a learning management system so that we could have a platform in which teachers students and parents could engage in the instruction if they're not in person. So we um, went through this process by really thinking about the systemic benefits of our learning management system, um, what's the long-term benefits of it, what's, how can it support our curriculum work, how can it support our family engagement, um, and really how can it integrate with the other systems we already have. So our tech coaches were tasked with really trying out a bunch of systems to see what works for them. Um, many of the teachers had tried some over the closure, just trying out some things to see what would work. So upon the recommendation of the tech coaches, which is a, a plethora of about 15 teachers district-wide, they recommended that we go to one learning management system um, which would help families who need to get on um, with multiple students across the district. It would also help with our um, traveling staff who may be between elementary, middle school, I even had a teacher elementary high school, so they didn't have to learn two systems. Also, some of our special education teachers also, you know, our speech teachers and things go between buildings. So um, they recommended Canvas as the learning management system, knowing that it's going to be a very steep learning curve. And we have a lot of staff already experiencing anxiety about how to learn this as quick as possible. Um, I was talking to the rep today and she said, you know, when you go to a big apple tree, you don't pick the tallest fruit first, you pick from the bottom. So we just have to ensure that we give the support to the staff, that we're going to start small. These are our minimal non-negotiables. We're going to be there to support you and we're going to grow with this system and it's going to be able to offer a lot of cool opportunities moving forward throughout the years even when we're not in a situation like we're in so that is how we came to the decision that you see today with the three-year contract so it's something we have to pay for every year yes how much was it i, didn't pay for it. <laughs> I think it's fifty-eight thousand. over three years or every year <laughs> $22,772.30 the first year, uh, $17,772 the second year, $17,772 change. Third year grand total was $58,316.90. Thank you, Mike. The years are off, though. Why is it starting next year? I'm sorry, say Why is it starting next year, August? You're saying the contract date is wrong? Yeah. The contract date starts in August? Of 2021. It should say 2020. No, ma'am. It goes from 2021 to 2024. We'll adjust that. So it's okay. on the understanding that it's going to start this fall. <clears throat> okay. I don't want to pay them yeah. and then they say yeah. come back next year. <laughs> 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 this system is used by all the UWs and also the tech system as well. 
some? Yeah, I took some on TC courses and they use it so they could show, you know, the teacher could talk and they could show mm -hmm. something on the computer screen and mm -hmm. they can have quizzes that it automatically grades yes. and shows all your grades. And it intersects with the syllabus with and the PDF and it seems like it works. Yeah. You know, and we did find that some students, um, even though we did have students, we had you know, lost a little bit over the closure, we did have some students who really got engaged in this type of learning. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's going to provide that opportunity for some of those other students to catch them as well. Okay. Any other uh, questions or comments? And, uh, we, Mary Kay, we do have a motion in a second. And we'll, then we'll go ahead with the roll call. Hold it. Yes. Dean? Yes. Dean? Yes. Nobel? Yes. Hyatt? Yes. Schrader? Yes. Balder? Yes. And Mary? Yes. And we'll go on to item D, consideration to amend the 2019-20 budget. I move the board approve the amended 2019-2020 budget as presented. I'll second that. Any uh, questions or comments from the board? Or, Tim, do you have anything to add Andy, to this? Andy, the only other thing that I would have is um, since I, the, the upload on Thursday yesterday, uh, last week, um, I failed to uh, include the uh, dental uh, account balance as part of the fund balance. So there's a, a slight adjustment to the budget amendment that, um, that we uploaded today. So it doesn't affect the overall fund balance, it just affects how it gets segregated. And um, so it's a restricted portion, a larger restricted portion in fund balance. But the, the memo highlights the, the primary changes. And this is a uh, requirement that our auditors like us to see that we true up the, the budget from actual, from the original budget back in October. Anything else from anybody? Questions? And then we will go ahead with the roll call on this. Yes. 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 Newbell? Yes. Hyatt? Yes. Schrader? Yes. Balzer? Yes. Holder? Yes. Mary? Yes. We'll go on to item E, report regarding district personnel new hires. I move the board approve the following new hire, Katie Yardro, music teacher. Second that. Any uh, questions or comments from anybody? We'll do a roll call on that too, Mary Kay. Need? Yes. Newfell? Yes. Hyatt? Yes. Schrader? Yes. Balzer? Yes. Boulder? Yes. D? Yes. Mary? Yes. We'll go on to item F, report of employee resignations and retirements. I move the board approve the retirement of Cindy Martin, middle school art teacher, and the following resignations. <coughs> Excuse me. Elizabeth Burdick, USDA music instructor, Jeff Newfeld, steam teacher, Jamie Hitz, East Elementary SPED and instructional assistant, Marlene Hess. North Elementary Math and Rating Sport Teacher, Amy Woodward, 8th Grade Math Teacher, Rebecca Spencer, High School Housekeeping, and Kelly Fossbender, Director of Instruction. Second. Okay, any questions or comments from anybody? And I'd just like to say thank you to all of these people for the uh, service they've given the uh, Anago School District. And then uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. And uh, item G, report of donations. I move the board accept the following donations, $500 from Corantage Credit Union for fill a backpack, fill a need program, $100 from Zerzowski Wood Products for fill a backpack, fill a need program, $3,307 from Satori Cheese Company, product donation for COVID feeding meals, $100 from Ambron for fill a backpack for the NEED program. $25 from Joyce R. Erickson Memorial for Clara Abmecan Aquatic Center. 
$500 from CHAMPS for fill a backpack for the NEED program, $250 from Winter, Winter and Barons for the Nabokan School Forest Building Project, $4,500 from Agro Industries in kind materials, maintenance, and training for the AHS metals program, and $750 from the Antigo Elves, large number 662 for the Nabokan School Forest Building Project. Second. Okay, uh, thank you to all these uh, who have donated to the district. Again, very generous to our district. Um, any other comments? Anybody would like to make our questions? And then all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. And then we'll go on to seven. Uh, consideration of a motion to adjourn into closed session pursuant to Wisconsin statute 19.851C, considering employment, promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation data of any public employee over which the governmental body has jurisdiction or exercises responsibility specifically for the performance evaluation for the district administrator. So moved. Seconded. Oh, uh, roll call. Newfell? Yes. Pius? Yes. Schrader? Yes. Falzer? Yes. Folder? Yes. Deep? Yes. Need? Yes. And Mary? Yes. And I think we'll take a short break here before we uh, get going.